Hi, Brian Anthony Garcia here. Welcome to the very first episode of this series called Tech Thursday. So if you can tell, this is inspired by Microsoft's Azure Friday, hosted mainly by Scott Hanselman. Uh, we're going to talk to different Microsoft tech professionals to demo something about their expertise, ask questions, and uh, give their insights. You know, Tonight, we're here with Philip Domingo from Microsoft. So, hey, Philip. How are you doing? Hey, hey, Brian. Mm -hmm. I'm good. So, you know, it's Sunday today, so it's pretty much chill, but we're back at work again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, we're back uh, at work as well. So, uh, can you uh, talk to us about what you do at Microsoft? Yeah. So, I currently work at Microsoft as a cloud solutions architect, in where, you know, as a cloud solutions architect, I'm currently a part of what you call as Cost, uh, uh, I'm currently part of what they call as Customer Success Unit, or CSU for short. Mm -hmm. And where what we do, what we primarily do is we primarily work with you know customers. And where in my case, in my con, in 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 my in, in my role, I primarily work with both enterprise and public sector customers in the Philippines. And we make sure that our customers make the most out of their investment in Microsoft products, which is in my case. The context of the cloud cloud computing services of Microsoft, which is Microsoft Azure. Nice. That sounds very nice. So, uh, again, uh, with Philip, we'll talk about how Azure's top 300 customers were able to stay compliant uh, with corporate and external standards with with uh, regards to their Azure environment. So, Philip is here to show us how you can standardize your your company or maybe your uh, cu customer's um, Azure environment with Azure policy. So, Philip, what is uh, or why Azure policy? One of the main examples in where, why would you want to care or why you would want to use Azure policies? Because, you know, you need to implement some sort of governance in your environment. You want to have some sort of resource consistency. You want to have, you, you, you need to comply in some sort of regulatory compliance that you're following within your organization. Let's say in the context of banks, or you know, you want to take a look at security, you want to manage the cost, and you want to control how Azure or how application team or you know different users in your organization uses Azure, how they you know they would provision their environment, they would provision different sorts of services. And you know, again, this is very important because again, going back earlier, maybe you would think implement governance, that seems to be boring. But if you think about it, especially in the case of resource consistency because like in my case i've seen some sort you know different environments in where it's very inconsistent let's say in an application a their environment has some sort of loggings and there are security components enabled you know there's some sort of alerts you know all the you know all the all the boring stuff that you would need in in, in operations once you once you go to production and then when you look at application b which is a different project Application B is just bare bone infrastructure. There's a server, there's a database, they're already in production. But if you look at it, there's no dashboard, there's no loggings, there's no alerts, there's no, there's no, there's nothing sort of security components in their in their environment, right? So having consistency in your environment would be would be very much important. You know, you want to standardize your environment, you want to make sure. As you build different applications, as you build different projects in your organizations, you want to make sure that it's consistent. That if you say in production environment, everything should have some sort of loggings, everything should should have some sort of security components, especially for public facing applications. In in other sort of things that you would do, you would you would have you would need in your organizations. You want to make sure that out of all your applications, all your projects that is especially running in production, you want to make sure that it is consistent. So this is where Azure policy would come in. Yeah, so uh, seems like Azure policy is something that uh, you implement in, uh, in an environment. So is it like something that, uh, you know, all the customers, all your customers have or should have? Is it kind of like, is it for everyone? Or, I would uh, say yes mm -hmm. for, for, for everyone, given that, you know, this is for governance. This is like part of your fundamentals or part of your foundation in your cloud adoption journey, right? And then, like, do, do all of my customers already using this? Uh -huh. 
not yet. It's all in progress. You know, it's I'm working on it. You know, because you know, like what I mentioned, not everyone still still like realize the the value of having this. So we're working on you know educating customers on why this is important. Given that it's for it's for you know consistency, it's for governance of their Azure environment. Right. So yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess maybe that this is just me, but maybe most, if not all, of my I don't know. All of my clients, I have not really implemented Azure policy, so I guess I'm really late to the party. Yeah, so you know, maybe at least after this talk, yeah. you know, this is the time you're gonna start yeah. exploring. Yeah, yeah, so I'm learning so, a lot now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so anyway, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is just to give you some examples in where how you know other organizations usually like implement their governance and in their infrastructure, right? So. One example, you know, some of the examples I wanted to show here is that, let's say, for example, in the context of private cloud, in the context of on-premises approach. So you should hear, if you think about governance, it is very easy to control it, right? Because if you think about it, usually the application team, the developers, their only responsibility, their only role is to just focus on developing the application, right? Their code, making sure the application is up and running, and by the time they're finished, you know, writing their application, building their application, that's where they're going to go to the core IT and ask them, hey, I need you to create a virtual machine. I need you to create this infrastructure with the specs, with the software installed, and then we will be needing this for production or we'll be needing this for a certain environment. So in this case, the role of IT is just to really you know, get that application build that infrastructure, and then how they're going to be building that infrastructure is already aligned based on the organization standards, right? So pretty much the core IT should be skilled enough to be able to, to, to do that because that's their, their main responsibility. So in the context of on-premises, I'd say very, very easy to, you know, to, to, to manage the governance because there's only a few sets of people who's, who's building the infrastructure, right? So that's one in the context of on-premises approach. Next example would be in a cloud traditional approach. In this case, my example here would be in a cloud traditional approach, this is where an organization coming from an on-premises who's now adopting cloud, who's now using Azure. So usually in some organization, what they would do is that they're simply translating the things, you know, the role, the things that they're doing on-premises in a cloud. So like in this case, it's pretty much the same on the on-premises approach. The only difference that is that it is in the cloud. So like in this case, the cloud custodian, pretty much, you know, like what I mentioned earlier, organizations just simply translating what we're doing on-premises to the cloud. So usually, the cloud custodian will be the, the core IT, the central IT. So they're the same set of people who will, who will still be controlling the, the Azure environment. But like in this case, the application team, will still be focused on building the application, writing their code, and then once they're done, this is now, they're going to talk to the cloud custodian that, hey, I need you to build an environment for us, X number of environment, and then deploy this application, right? So, which is in this case, cloud custodian will now be, or the, the core IT will now be building the infrastructure instead of on-premises, now in the cloud. So, pretty much the same. So, because, in, so, what, what you'll see here is that usually how they're controlling it is that the cloud, the, the core IT is simply just preventing the application team, you know, the developers from having an access in the, into the cloud portal, which is in this case Azure, Azure portal. So technically, they're not involved in any sort of like cloud environment. So again, similar to the on-premises approach, just focus on building the application and then hand it over to the cloud custodian. So sometimes the problem here is because you should, if you think about it, right, in the context of cloud, building your infrastructure should now be a lot faster. You know, should be should things should be agile. Because if you think about it, when you provision any service in Azure, usually it would just take about a few minutes and pretty much you already have it. But sometimes the thing with the thing with having this cloud traditional approach, at least what I've noticed in in some of my experience at work, is that sometimes the core IT could be an impediment. There could be they could there they could be the one who's blocking 
the progress of the development of the application of of, uh, of having an infrastructure because the reason for that is because you know core IT you know these people because the thing here is that usually what will happen right is the application team will not be requesting an environment to this core to, to this team to the to this cloud engineers to this cloud custodian but the thing is sometimes what will happen is that the cloud custodian team would get back to them at least a week or so just to be able to provide that environment. And you might be wondering, what do you mean by by a week? You know, because like what I mentioned earlier, if you think about cloud, you can pretty much provision any sort of services in a span of few minutes. So why am I saying here that sometimes cloud cloud team, the, the cloud custodian team could take about at least a week just getting back to the application team or to, to the business unit, you know, giving them their, their environment. And the main reason for this is because these people, these people, they are usually busy, right? Because like what I mentioned earlier, sometimes the, the, the same set of IT people who's managing the on-premises environment are the same set of people who will be managing the, the cloud environment. And sometimes the challenge there is that these people, this group of people, it's not like they're just sitting around at their home and then and then just waiting for an application or for, for the developers or for a business unit to request for an environment. You know, they're you know, they're also busy doing other things. They're also do busy doing their job. You know, they're they're busy making making sure that their on-premises environment is still up and running. They're busy, you know, they're busy doing firefightings, making sure that whatever issues are arising and whatever in their environment they're currently maintaining is, is currently addressed. So sometimes you know, whenever an application team would request this environment, it's not like they would instantly be able to deliver it. So sometimes that's a problem with, you know, with this approach. But then again, it works in the context of governance because you can pretty much control how the infrastructure will be built. It's just sometimes if in the context of cloud and where, you know, you want to move things fast, sometimes that won't be the case given that the, 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 the core IT won't be always available to address to that. So... That's a the cloud traditional approach. Yeah, that's exactly what I've experienced back then as well. You know, I had this project wherein I was one of the developers and we had to, you know, we wanted to deploy something in the cloud just, you know, to make sure that everything's working. It's just on the test anyway. But so uh, we had to change something. We had to ask uh, the cloud team to do something about it. And we were expecting it to be done for like two to three days. And that that is just, you know, We've already added uh, a few more days, or uh, we've already asked him uh, ahead of time because we needed it on that exact day. But then, right after that, uh, he j apparently he just saw that you know we asked for it. Apparently, he was so busy that uh, he didn't see <laughs> that we had uh, yeah. we had requested something to be done on the cloud. And so, it's really uh, it's really annoying. But at the same time, I understand it as well. You know. Yeah. You know, that's that's life. <laughs> that's exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Yeah, so, th so that's why you know the next example I wanted to show here, which is like the the ideal approach, and and, and sometimes this is what the 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 some organizations are already doing is that what they're doing is that instead of a core IT, which is the one who's centrally managing everything, in 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 their cloud environment, they're now letting the application team, you know, do it themselves. Right. So the thing here is that. So the thing here is that in 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 the case of the application team being able to access the environment, and then the core IT not building the those environment anymore. So what you wanted to do here is this is where Azure policies would come in, because th let's say for example there's no such thing as policy, and your organization or implementing you know have this operating model in a way the application team is the one who's doing who's now doing everything right so usually there are two things that could happen here now let's say the developers who's now being able to build their own azure environment instead of them needing to go to the to the cloud custodian team so there are two things that could happen here number one as they build the application and then build the infrastructure at the same time by the time they're they're going to be going into production what they would be doing in the first scenario would be this is now they're going to be having a discussion with the SMEs, with the core IT, especially the cybersecurity team, to ask them, that, hey, based on the infrastructure that we've built, 
we want to consult with you because we're now targeting this production date in this maybe next month or, or next few months. We want to make sure that this infrastructure we've built is aligned based on our organization standards. So from here, this is now, there's going to be a lot of back and forth discussion between the cybersecurity team, the infrastructure, the, the core IT team, and then the application team, making sure that the infrastructure that the application team is building is aligned to the organization standard. So that one works, but of course, the only thing there, the, the only thing that could that could that could delay things is that the back and forth discussion between the application team and then the cybersecurity team. Because what would happen here is okay, application team will be consulting to the cybersecurity team, to the priority team on how they should be building things or what are the things that they need to consider prior to going to production. So the application team will be will be will be doing that. We'll be building additional infrastructure like adding application firewall and things like that. And then by the time they're done building it and where they think they've already configured in a way how it should be configured aligned to the organization standard, that's where they're gonna have another meeting with the cybersecurity team, the core ID team, for them to check that hey, this is now the infrastructure we built based on our previous conversation. Can you check if this is aligned, if this is correct? And then hopefully, yes, but if not, another set of back and forth discussion. So again, it works. It's just there's going to be a lot of back and forth discussion. But that's that's first scenario in where, you know, if there's no such thing as Azure policy, what they would usually do. Number two, another example in where what could anywhere what could possibly be what could possibly happen if you know you let your application team build their own infrastructure without any sort of core IT team being involved with them building this, this infrastructure. What could happen here in a second scenario is that, okay, application team now building their own application, building their own infrastructure, and then they're now going to be going to production. What could happen is that they're not going to talk to anyone. They're simply just, okay, we think this is fine. Yes, because you should as a developer, right? At least for me, when I started as a developer, my only focus is just to make things work. That's the only thing I think about. I'm not going to think about anything related to security. Well, I think about security, but not in a way, you know, not, not, but not very extensive at that point back then. But the, because the thing here, what could happen is that they're going to be, because they have access to everything, they're building the application, they're building the infrastructure. What would happen is that by the time they're going to be going into production, they're not going to be consulting into anyone. They're not going to be talking to the cybersecurity team. They're not going to be talking to the, the core IT team. Maybe they will talk in some way that, hey, we're building this application. Well, we need to be certified or something. But, you know, pretty much that's it. So by the time they're going to production, and then I came there assessing, hey, what's wrong? You know, may I look at your Azure environment? That's where I realized that, you know what? It's super messy. Like I've seen some environments in where the application server is in is deployed in US and then database server is deployed in Singapore and then maybe like some 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 APIs would be deployed in another part of the world so it's 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 very messy and then if you look at it there's nothing sort of any security components there's no application firewall there's no there's no there's no sort of there's nothing sort of loggings enabled there's no dashboard. There's no sort. There's nothing related to alert. So if you ask them, like, how, how, how are you guys so far? I mean, what are you doing in terms of operations? How how do you how do you how, how, how do you know when something is wrong to your application? You know, and they would tell me, you know, when 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 our customer says when you know something's wrong, or or you know, we don't know. So sometimes it's 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 it it becomes messy. So this is where. In the context of the application team being able to have being 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 independent, being able to have an access into to to a lot of things, you know, being able to build an application and at the same time infrastructure. So this is where you would usually want to think about applying policy. So in this case, even though that the core IT won't be like directly involved into building the infrastructure, what you wanted to do as the, as part of the core IT in an organization is that. You still want to standardize, right? You want to you want to have some sort of governance into this application team that yes, they're they're they 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 now have the authority to build their own infrastructure, but at the same time, you want to have some sort of control on how they can build their infrastructure in Azure. So again, 
this is where Azure policies can come in. So this is where you're going to be applying some sort of policies that say you want you want to control what are the Azure resources that these people can only provision or where can where can it only be provisioned? Because sometimes what you've noticed is that if you just let them just keep on building their infrastructure, sometimes you know you would see a development environment having a 64 gigs of RAM virtual machine. Sometimes you would see an environment that is like what I mentioned earlier deployed in many parts of the world. And then if you ask them why is this deployed this way, simply because they they didn't realize that they 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 deployed it into many regions. Or or you know you just simply want to audit it. You just you you want to control how how things are being provisioned. You you know you want to implement some sort of governance. So this is where I'm going to be showing you how Azure policy would make sense because again this Azure policy, especially if you're part of the core IT and then you want to control how your application team in your organization from different business units, how you can control the 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 provisioning of Azure Azure services. In certain environments, so this is where Azure Policy could come would would come in for you to be able to have some sort of guardrail that you would usually do if you are if you're the one building the the environment as your as the core IT. So these are some of the examples that, that I wanted to share. So now maybe you might be wondering that okay, the things that I shared earlier maybe you know because the things I've shared earlier are in the context of an enterprise, right? In the context of you know. There are multiple teams. Uh, there are segregation of duties, like there are for IT, there are cybersecurity cyber team or application team, and all of that. Now you might be thinking that, hey, you know what? I'm not actually part of a big organization. I'm actually part of a startup, you know. And and the one I was, you know, the things I was mentioning earlier when it comes to the responsibilities, I'm that one person who's doing all of that. So now, if in that case, if I'm that one person who's doing all of this. Does it still make sense for me, you know, to think to even to even care or to even think about Azure policy? I would say yes, because let me give you an example. I have here an example of an N-tier application architecture, and we're in the, in this context, you know, we're primarily using infrastructure as a service. And if you think about it, we have a lot of virtual machines. So we have a virtual machine for we have a jump box for a management for for management. We have our web tier, we have our front end, and then we have an internal load balancer for our APIs. And then we have our database, and then even this application gateway that ideally will be using as an application firewall. So now, if you think about this, let's say in a production envi environment, like what I mentioned earlier, typically prior to going to production, you want to make sure that certain things are configured in your environment prior to going to production. What are those things? Like I mentioned earlier, one of the things that you want to make sure is that number one, you want to make sure that all these environments that you have right now up and running, especially in production environment, is you know have some sort of logs. In the case of Azure, and like this will be log analytics. You want to make sure that all of the services that you have right now in this environment is you know being is is integrated with log analytics. That's number one. Another thing that you want to make sure is in in your application firewall, especially for greenfield projects. You want to make sure that your application firewall is not just, you know, is is you want to make sure that your applica application firewall is configured to prevent and, and not just to detect, right? Because usually what I've noticed is for some of my customers, yes, they would say that, hey, we're using some sort of application firewall. And then if you look at the configuration of the application firewall, you know, it's just on detection mode for the longest time. So they technically, their application firewall is not blocking anything. It's just monitoring any sort of possible attacks that is being that is happening in their environment. So it's not preventing. So ideally in a production environment, you want to make sure that your firewall is blocking things, not just monitoring things. That's number two. Another example would be let's say in the database. You want to make sure that your database, when you configure this for production, your database is not accessible publicly. Right? You want to make sure that the communication between your application server, your API to your to your database server is via network instead of via internet. So you want to make sure that your virtual machines and your database, whatever database that is, may be it could be even it could be not just a virtual machine, it could be even a platform as a service, it's not accessible via internet. And then in the context of just virtual machines, you want to make sure that all your virtual machines here, any sort of management port 
is not open to public. You know, you want to make sure that RDP, SSH port, is not it's not it's not open to just anything. Maybe you want to make sure that those RDP, SSH port, whatever port you're using for management is only accessible via management via your jump box, right? So don't these are just some of the examples in where you want to make sure you, you like you want to have a checklist that you want to make sure that, okay, prior to production, my environment should look like this. So now imagine managing different application that looks like this. Manage, you know, imagine having an env multiple environments, managing multiple projects that looks like this. Eventually, it will be very hard to keep up, right? Because imagine here, let's say you have like more than 10, 10 virtual machines. Imagine making sure all those virtual machines have some, some, have some sort of, of, of uh, configuration, like having some sort of logs, having some sort of correct configuration for the, for the ports and things like that. So what I'm saying here is in the context of Azure policy, it could actually help you automate some of the boring stuff. Automate in a way that let's say every time you provision a virtual machine in your production environment, that virtual machine will automatically be configured to have to be to be to be connected into your log analytics, right? right. You want it, then then in this case, whenever you provision an application firewall, you want to make sure that it is provisioned. This this the, the settings is configured to be in prevention mode rather than detection mode. If it is in detection mode, maybe. You want to prevent the provisioning of that application firewall because that is not aligned or your, on your organization standards. So those are some of the things that that you know Azure policy would make sense because again, just imagine being that one person managing multiple environments that looks like this is going to be very hard to 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 maintain. It's very it's it's going to be very hard to keep up. So that's yeah. I just have a question. Um, you know, first of all, I just want to mention that. Uh, Thank you for uh, mentioning that, you know, like there are, uh, a, a, there are uh, people who, are, who work as a one-man team. And, you know, I was actually wondering before if uh, this would make sense because I only, well, at least for some of my clients, I'm the only developer, I'm the only uh, cloud guy. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, a, again, a one-man team. So it, it, it good, uh, it's good to hear that it is, uh, you know, it, is, it would still work for us even though we're uh, like yeah. so. Um, maybe, but my other question would be, like you mentioned that you know some of uh, like you can actually set up uh, access controls maybe to allow or deny some uh, some access. Um, is it something that I'm not really sure, but it can be done without Azure policy? What do you mean? Uh, I like... mean, like for example, uh, like you mentioned earlier, if you want to access, like example, uh. A, a VM, something like that. It, it, you can set up access controls uh, uh, through a different, uh, di different way, not just uh, Azure policy. Is it, or am I understanding it uh, incorrectly? Well, I would say that one is different because I think your question is more of a like, what are the different ways you can access a virtual machine? Uh -huh. But in this way, what I was, you know, what I what I mentioned earlier is that. What are, what are the ways you can enforce how your environment would look like, let's say in the case of a virtual machine? Like in this case, what I've mentioned is that you want to make sure maybe you want to standardize that the way you're going to be accessing your virtual machine as a as as the, the, the admin would be instead of directly accessing the virtual machine, right. uh, the, 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 the application server the, the, or the database server or the API server, what you wanted to do is Instead of doing that, accessing it directly, what you're going to be doing is you, you instead access it through the jump box server. And then from the jump box server, that is now where you're going to be accessing different virtual machines. Okay. Why? Because like what I mentioned earlier, maybe sometimes what you wanted to do is you want to make sure that all these virtual machines on the back end doesn't have some sort of public IP. Right. That all those public access are going through a load balancer. And then the only way for you to access it is through a jump box. Because this is the only one that has an IP. So there are different ways. It could be a jump box server. It could be an Azure Bastion. So it depends on how you want to standardize that into your organization right. to it. a policy. Got it. Okay. Okay. So now the next thing I wanted to do is just to give you a demo on how Azure policy would look like. Because maybe now you're curious. Okay. Maybe let's give it a try. How does it look like in Azure? All right. So now if you want to get started with Azure policy, of course, First thing you're going to be doing is go to your Azure portal. 
And then from an Azure portal, what you just need to do is go to policy. You know, just simply search for policy. And then from here, you're going to be seeing this dashboard. And then from here, you will see in my overview page, you already see some sort of overall percentage of my resource compliance in my Azure environment, which is, as you can see here, my score is 27%. I only have like three sets of compliant uh, policies where I'm compliant out of 11 that is available out there, right? And then from here, yeah. So so this is how it looks like. And then from here, if I if I view all, you will see all the policies that I that I have currently enabled. So this is where what I'm going to be talking about later. So, but yeah, this is how it looks like. This is how the, the, the homepage of Azure policy look like. So now to get started. So again, so the difference here, and I would suggest, you know, you, you, you make the most out of this. You use this as much as possible because usually, again, going back to where there's no such thing as Azure policy, how my customers would usually use it is they will have their, their, their checklist, their security checklist or their like governance checklist will be some sort of PDF or, or Microsoft Word or, or Google Docs, whatever it is that they're, you're using. Anywhere. That, that, that is where it contains the list of what are the things that their, their, their environment should have prior to going to production. And you know that, that's fine, that works, but the thing there is like what I mentioned, in the cloud, things changes fast, right? So maybe let's say, for example, right now, you've, you've checked the Azure environment based on your checklist. It's okay, it's fast. But maybe a few months from now, you know the environments that you've assessed, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's not. It's not the same environment as before. So again, you need to do some sort of end-to-end -end checking again, just to be able to make sure that that environment is compliant or not. So what I would usually recommend to my customers is that instead of having that, you know, documented checklist on how your environment should look like, use this one instead, because. The reason for that is because this will at least reflect how your Azure environment would look like. This would actually, this could actually pinpoint that if there are any resources within your Azure environment that is not compliant within your within your standard, you can actually see here what are those environments that is not compliant, right? And I'll be I'll be showing that later on. But now let's say we want to get started. We want to apply some sort of policy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna be going to the assignments, and then once I click assignments. You'll see two things here. You're going to see assign policy or assign initiative. We'll be starting with policy because you know assign policy. This is where we're going to be assigning a single policy that we want to add in our environment. So from here, from this assign policy page, assign policy form. First thing is scope. You'll see this scope, right? So if I look at the scope, just to give you some background, scope. There are many ways in where you can apply policy. You can either you know, there are four different ways on how you can apply policy. One is to a management group, if you're using that. Number two is to a subscription. You want to apply that policy into your entire set of subscription. Number three is to a resource group. Maybe instead of a subscription, you only want to apply it in a single resource group. And number four, into individual resources. Okay. So for this demo, what I'm going to be doing is uh, maybe I'll just, I'll, I have this sample resource group right now and where this is where I'm going to be applying it. So instead of just subscription as a whole, I'm, I'll be specifying, I'll be assigning this policy into a specific resource group. From here, select, uh, so and then I, you also have an option. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, go ahead. I just have a question. Uh, since you mentioned that it is possible to assign it to those four different um, you know, uh, management groups and uh, subscriptions, resource group, and uh, a resource so let's just say that you put or assign the uh policy to a subscription will it be inherited by uh the uh underlying like uh by the resource group and the resource yep yeah that's actually the main purpose of that so okay. usually in my case what i usually recommend to my customers is instead of applying these policies to a single subscription apply it into a management group because for those who's not yet familiar with what a management group is Management group is where you simply group multiple subscriptions all together. So usually how we design it is that we have a management group for public facing applications, 
for a specific or a dedicated subscription. Like we have another management group dedicated for internal only, you know, subscriptions. So you know things like that. And then from there, that is that's where you're going to be applying certain policies. Because if you think about it, you know, you're going to have some sort of policies for public facing application, and then you're you're going to have some sort of different policies for internal facing application. So usually we would do it do uh, that way. Okay. So now going back, besides from the scope, you also have this exclusion. So sometimes maybe you want to apply this into a subscription, but let's say you don't want to apply this policy to all the resource within the subscription. Maybe, okay, you only want to apply this policy into your resource group, into into majority of your resource group, except for the resource group for your non-production environment. Let's say your dev test environment or your sandbox environment. So in that case, maybe you want to exclude them from you know being audited by the policy so this is where you can you can use exclusion and then specify what are those resource group that you want to exclude from this policy okay and then next is the policy definition so click this policy definition by default you're going to see a lot of out of the box policy out there actually this there's there's around i think 600 plus built in policies and then in my case i've just added some sort of you know additional custom policies because you also have the option to build your own custom policy. So, but usually what I would recommend is if you're just starting, just start with built-in policy. Because let's say, for example, one, so one, some, basic, some basic policies that you would want to apply in your environment would be allowed location. Maybe in this case, you know, you want to control where and what in what regions can your team can only deploy some sort of Azure resources, right? Because I would say this is one of the common common challenge in terms of governance that you would see different people deploying different environments, different different services in different regions all over the world. Like what I mentioned earlier, application servers in US, database servers in Singapore. But sometimes you want to prevent that. You want to make sure that, okay, what makes sense for the business is just to maybe put all services in Singapore because that's where that's the that's that's where the closest to where our users are currently at. So you know for lower latency. In this case, maybe you want to have a policy for allowed location, and then what you wanted to do on the next page is on the parameters. So from here, this is where we're going to be specifying, okay, what are those locations that you want to enforce that, that is only allowed to be provisioned in, in your environment? So let's say in this case, maybe it's only Southeast Asia. You put it here, and then you know, whatever, whatever regions that would make sense for you. But for this one, I'm not going to I'm not going to be applying it because I already have an example for allowed location for this policy. But just to walk you through on you know how creating a policy would look like. So this is the parameters. So usually this would change because if, for example, I change this into let's say a policy related to web app. Let's say we want to have a policy that will audit in where we can monitor that in where we want to standardize that. Okay, all app services should only be accessible via FTPS instead of FTP. So let's say this one, you want to apply this next. Then from here, you'll notice it's the parameters are different. So here you can only see either audit if that exists, meaning to say, you know, you will see in the dashboard if there, if there are certain web apps that is not configured to, that is not enforced to, that is not configured that it should only be accessible via FTPS and not just F, and not FTP. Or you can just disable it, meaning to say, you know, if disabled, simply any this policy will not will not take effect. So usually, if you're just starting with policy, what I would highly recommend is just because there are different policies which I'm going to be showing earlier. There are policy for the die, there are policy for deploy if it's not existing, there are policy for you know audit for append, modify, and things like that. But usually, what I would recommend is that if you're just starting with policy, you know, you're just getting to to, to feel how it works, you just start with audit, you know, with everything related to audit. Because here, in auditing, you can make sure that you're not affecting any existing workflow. Because if, for example, you, you now start to implement some sort of policy for denying certain Azure services to provision if it's not aligned. Because sometimes the challenge there you could be is that you could be, you could be, you could you could be affecting the existing workflow of your of your team, right? So let's say you've implemented some sort of policy. And then maybe you didn't configure that policy correctly. And then now it's preventing the team to provision these resources because of this policy. So it's affecting the workflow. So pretty much if you're just starting with, if you're just getting started with Azure policy, just start with audit. At least from there, 
looking going if you go back to the Azure policy dashboard, at least you can see how it looks like. So that's on the parameters, remediation. This one, I'm going to skip this for now, but this is very important. I'll talk about this later on if you have time, but you know, I'm not going to talk about this right now. But just for now, next. But this, this remediation is only applicable if your policy is, if your policy effect is deploy if not exist instead of, you know, audit. This, this is where remediation comes in. And then non-compliance message, you know, non-compliance. So, you know, what's the, what's the name that should look like on the, on the dashboard? So just in this case, I'm just going to copy paste this one and then create. Here we go. Okay. So now if, by the way, if you go back, so this is how policy looks like. So if you look at policy, you can just apply it one by one. Now, sometimes one of the things that, you know, you might be wondering about here is that, you know, maybe this could be overwhelming because if you look at all the policies available here, there's around 742. So now you may be thinking that, hey, are you expecting me to go all through this 742 policy definition, which is in my case, in, my, in, the, in the context of my environment, just for me to understand or just for me to assess what are the policies that make sense for me or not, right? So maybe, you know, maybe it could be overwhelming. Maybe you don't know where to start, right? So what I would usually recommend if in your, in that situation is that you go back to the policy and instead of going to the assigned policy, you go to assign initiative. What is this assigned initiative? This initiative, or what they also call as policy set, what this basically means is that these are collection of different policies. Because earlier, policy is just you know assigning, assigning single policy that you want to apply in your environment. But in this case, initiative, this is where you can group multiple policies all together so that if you apply it, all those different policies are already implemented. So if you go here to assign assign initiative, you know. How it looks like is pretty much the same on how assigned policy looks like. Only difference is that if you look at the initiative de definition, you'll now see that there's only around 32. So this is where I usually talk to my customers and ask them, hey, Mr. or Ms. Customer, in your organization, are you following some sort of regulatory compliance? And that's where they would mention that, yes, actually we're, we're following the CS benchmark or we're following this ISO 27001 or we're following this PCI DSS. And if you look at this, Azure already has some template that is already aligned to those regulatory compliance. So let's say, say as benchmark, there's already an initiative, which is a collection of policies aligned for say as benchmark for this checklist. Or if you look at ISO 27001, there's already one for that one, PCI DSS. And now you might be thinking, you know what? Again, we're from startup. We're, I'm coming from a startup organization. We're not thinking, we're not yet thinking about any of those regulatory compliance. So in that case, where should I get started, right? So, you know, I don't know, I, I don't want to take a look at those 740 policy definitions that I've shown earlier. And then if I'm looking at this, at this initiative definition, I don't know if CIS benchmark, you know, makes sense for our organizations. I don't know if ISO 27001. And so I don't know what makes sense. So where should I get started with? So if you're in that situation in where you, you want to get started with Azure policy, but you don't know where in terms of what are the policies that you should implement. What I highly recommend is go to, is to use Azure Security Benchmark. So Azure Security Benchmark is our more of a general security checklist for Azure services. Like when I say general, like, you know, it covers most, if not all Azure services in your Azure environment and provides some recommendations on how you can better secure those environment for, you know, and how you can sec better secure those services for your environment. So if I click this and then select, you'll see in the parameters after it loads. So, so this Azure security uh, benchmark, do you, do, you, do you use this on, even on your, uh, you know, customers as well? Yep. So especially for customers who's not sure about the regulatory compliance that they're following, but usually, we have usually usually if I talk to my customers about the regulatory compliance that they're implementing or they're they're following, they usually have some like like what I mentioned earlier. And then sometimes on top of that, let's say CS benchmark, they would also follow the security benchmark at the same time. So they're following different initiatives in their environment. So Azure Security Benchmark, CAS, I mean Azure Security Benchmark, CS benchmark. And then probably some custom policies that is that makes sense for the organization. So, so it's kind of like your recommended default. Yeah. Uh, 
yep. policy. Okay. So, and then from here, if you look at the parameters, it actually covers a lot of things. Okay? So, let's say in the context of virtual machines, so there are some recommendations on how you should you should secure our, you, your virtual machines. You know, pretty, you can pretty much look at it, right? So, and then let's say, for example, in this case, web application should only be accessible by HTTPS. So these are the things that, that's kind of like basic stuff, but it's very important. Like, like this one, you know, it very much makes sense to ensure that your web application is only accessible by HTTPS instead of just HTTP, especially if it's public facing, right? So maybe you want to make sure that your application firewall should be enabled for your application gateway. So these are the things that is really useful as a, as a starting point if you're not yet sure where to get started with, with the policy. So this is that and, and from and, there. And, and these things uh, can always be updated, right? I mean, any of these can, like for example, if you use the address... Yep, you can always edit them. Oh. Please add anything oh. on top of it. So, so this is a good starting point if, you know, if you're not sure where to get started with Azure policy. And then remediation, you know, to what if once that policy or that initiative is applied, you'll actually be able to see you'll see the policies or the initiatives that you've currently assigned in your environment. Which is in this case, filter this, these are all the initiatives I have currently assigned. So I've accidentally the duplicated the Azure Security Benchmark. And then these are the policies that are currently aligned. So now as an example. What I have here is that I have a resource group that contains an entire application. So I have an app service, I have an app service, I have an Azure front door as my application firewall, and then I have my SQL database. So what I have here is a policy that has the following. So for one, So let's say some of the policies I've applied here for this example would be number one for my web application firewall for my Azure front door web application firewall should be enabled, which is as you can see here, it's not yet compliant. The reason for that is because if you go back to my Azure environment, you'll see you'll see in my front door that. I don't have some sort of pot of web application firewall policy currently applied. So technically, my Azure front door is not currently acting as an application firewall because I don't have any WAF policy currently configured here. So from here, it's saying to me, it's telling me that, hey, I'm not compliant to this one, which is right, because if you look at it, again, I'm not compliant. And the number two, this is the policy we have applied earlier. So FTPS should be required in your web app. If you look at this, this is how the policy looks like. It's telling me, oh, actually not yet because, so yeah, important important thing to, to, to take note here is that once you've aligned a policy, once you've assigned a policy, it's not yet immediately taking effect. So usually for a policy to take effect, it will take at least 30 minutes for it to be able to assess or to be able to give you a report of the what are the non-compliant resources within your Azure environment, which is in this case, it's not yet started. So that's why it's not just showing anything. But usually for other things that maybe, let's say, going back to the web application firewall, if you go back here, you can actually have a view on what is that service that is not compliant within the Azure environment, which is in this case, the one I shared earlier, which is my Azure front door, which is this one, right? So it's correct, showing to me correctly. And then for other things like this one, web application should only be accessible over HTTPS. If you look at this, it's telling me that, hey, my app service, that's not currently configured that way. So this is more of a auditing. So this is just giving you a report whether a certain policy is, whether a certain resources, a certain resource is compliant or not compliant into your environment. Okay, so this is how audit works. But usually, sometimes, because if I go back here to my presentation, you'll see that there's a lot of Azure policy effects that you can actually leverage. What I just showed earlier is just more of the auditing and audit if not exist. There are also other things like deny, disable, modify, deploy if not exist, append. So maybe just to give you a few examples before, you know, because we, we 
we're running out of time, just to show you some examples, like maybe how deny and deploy if not exist looks like. So for deny, what I have here is that in my Azure environment is I have this policy that only allows certain location. So if I look at my assignment here, what I'm saying is that, okay, I've only allowed Southeast Asia to be provisioned in my environment. So now, for example, if I go back to my resource group and then let's say I try to deploy another web app. And then let's say, let's put it here. Oops. For example, policy, demo, okay, whatever that is, control US, okay. I just proceed, next, next, and then provision. So for this example, you've uh, made the um, the region central US, but it so, only allow uh, Southeast Asia. So actually, this is where the usual problem comes in because if I go back earlier, especially for former customers who are very new to the to to Azure, you know, to the cloud, usually, you know, how the developers or how that ad admin would would be doing it. So okay, I'm gonna be filling up these empty forms. And then some of the, the forms, like this Draptum region, like it is only in Central US, they're not gonna be, they're not gonna care about it because they're just the, most of the things default. So what's gonna, what's gonna happen is because sometimes the default region is around in, in, is in Central US or in US, they'll just leave it as is, and then they'll proceed with the provisioning. So now if, for example, I try to create, I now try to provision my environment, you'll see that, hey, is giving me this deployment error. And then if you look at the, the reason behind for this error message, it's because I clicked the wrong button. Where was it again? Deployment. Oh, I think it has it's not something to do with the policy yet. So Let's try again. So maybe in this case, let's just try for the meantime, much faster one storage account. Storage policy demo. Next. We put it somewhere. Subscription doesn't support. Okay, maybe let's change it. This is a subscription that I'm using is very bare bone. They didn't really configure anything here. Maybe this one will work. Again, create. And then from here, there's a validation field. And if you look at it, you'll see that, hey, it's saying that, hey, you know what? This resource that you're, you want to provision was this allowed by the policy. And this policy specifically allowed location. It's saying that resources should only be provisioned in Southeast Asia. So this is one example of deny of, of Azure policy effect deny. Because in this case, you're blocking the certain services to be provisioned unless it is compliant in your Azure environment. Okay. Last example would be the deploy if not exist. So in my case, I have this policy called deploy resource diagnostic. So this is an initiative or what we call as policy set. Anywhere it contain it contains a lot of different policies that use this effect of deploy if not exist. Anywhere it makes sure that all these resources here should be able to be should should be able to have a diagnostic settings configured or log analytics workspace. So let's say what's applicable in my case is a web app, rather a web. or just an app service. In this case, app service both app service plan and then app service and then SQL database. So you can see here and then front door. So here, since I have a policy or an or rather an initiative that contains this deploy if not exist, what happened was when I provisioned this Azure services, so let me show you how it was implemented or it was configured in my environment. So for example, I look at my app service. So I initially deployed this as is. And then if you look at that activity log, and then time span of maybe 
last week. So here you see, though initially it was failed. Check. It's failed. Yeah, initially it was failed. But so as you can see here, there was this identity that automatically configured by app service to have a diagnostic settings for log analytics. So this is what I meant earlier that could, this could help you automate some of the boring stuff for environment, which is in my case, whenever I deploy a service in my an Azure service in my environment, it will automatically connect it to log analytics, which is as you can see here. So because of the deploy of not access policy action, if I now go if I now go to my diagnostic settings, you can see that I know that my app service is automatically configured with the name of set by policy to this log analytics workspace that I've specified in my policy. So those are some example of how policy works. So we don't have a lot of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share to you, you know, because there's a lot of things here. So what I'm going to share to you is, is that if you want to learn more about it, I suggest, you know, you take a look at this resource link, especially this Azure Enterprise Scale. This, this is what we call as our Enterprise Scale Landing Zone, and where policy, Azure policy is just, just one, one part of it. Like, how are you going to building your overall, you know, end-to-end -end infrastructure in Azure, not just on the governance piece, but you know, even on the other stuff, you know, you know, how do you make sure the infrastructure and things like that? So there are also some templates that contains for that that's for that we have for policy here, which is this one. So, you know, if you want to have some some samples on custom policy, you can take a look at this and see if it makes sense for you. All right. Uh, again, thank you so much, Philip, for that. Do uh, you have any uh, ways for us to uh, you know, share anything uh, to us in order for us to contact you? Yeah. Uh, if you want to, you know, say if you have any clarifications, you have any questions about this, you want to learn more about this, you can, re you can reach out to me in my personal, you know, I have my contact details in my personal website, prtdomingo.com. So all my contact details and how you can reach out to me are all there. So you can check it out. Nice. So uh, I guess for now, that is uh, that all the time that we have to discuss the uh, basics of the Azure policy. I learned a lot, actually. Uh, you know, I feel like in the future, I'll be able to implement Azure uh, policy, even if uh, I'm just a one-man team on some of my projects. So uh, I hope you guys will be able to uh, implement this as well. I really think that this, this is a good um, feature to have to include in your uh, environment or to your client's envir environment. And yeah, I hope that uh, Philip can join us in another uh, session to talk about to talk more about Azure Policy.